Hey, I'm Zach King, and today I'm responding to some of my top YouTube comments. Wait, uh, one, ah, oh, there it is. Oh. All right, let's jump into it. The following comment came from the first video posted to your Final Cut King YouTube channel. What video is it? Oh wow, we're going way back. We are going way back to the very beginning of YouTube, like a decade ago. It had to be a tutorial. I was teaching a lot of filmmaking. I bet it was, I remember one of the early ones was a Pleasantville effect, where you saturate just one color and desaturate the rest. Hey guys, Zach King here with another Final Cut Pro tutorial. Today we're gonna do a Pleasantville effect. I was right. Oh my gosh, how did I remember that? I think it's because the tutorial I was teaching how to desaturate a yellow and that kind of sticks in my mind. Final Cut King was my original YouTube channel. It was the first channel I made that was like public to, to kind of grow an audience. I had applied to a film school, I didn't get in. So it was that first year that I wasn't in the film school that I created the YouTube channel because I was really bored. I was like, I could make a YouTube channel and teach what I'm learning in Final Cut Pro. And at the time, there was no AdSense. It wasn't like you could make a career doing this. This was just kind of a fun hobby. And then right around the, a year later, um, they rolled out an AdSense program that I was able to participate in and realized, you know, like this maybe could be a thing. Please reply to these comments from that first video. Oh, what are we gonna find? Have or do you edit on a MacBook Pro 17 inch? And how do I reduce my render times? Man, these are old school questions because we were talking about render times and export settings. And half of that now is gone because we're shooting, like some of my videos are just shot on a phone and we post it straight up if it's you know a, a video we've made in camera. Now everything's just so good too. Back then it was like made a big difference for these render times. Now everything can just render. Your iPhone can render faster than that laptop could. What kind of camera and editing equipment did you use when you were getting started? So when I was getting started, actually, let me just grab it. It's right here. This is kind of cool. This was uh, one of the first cameras I used. It was a Sony uh, 3 CCD cam, uh, mini DV, and uh, there was a camera before this. My parents have lost it or I broke it probably. And then, um, and it actually still shoots. Like I shoot on these once in a while just for fun. I was teaching my son on that one. And then this one was my camera all throughout. I, I saved up money in high school. I mowed uh, hundreds and hundreds of lawns to save up. This thing was five grand. Now, if you think about like the 5D that you use now, that's like 2,500, maybe 3,000. So this thing was massive. And as a little kid, like, you know, this would be on my shoulder. Um, but this is an amazing, this is the Canon XL2. Absolutely love this camera. Still functions to this day. I have battery and tape to put in it every once in a while to take me back. I always tell people now who are like, how do I get started, what gear? It doesn't really matter, like in today's age, I kind of find that as an excuse to why you're not creating. Everyone's phone shoots better quality than this did. So the following comments came from the first video posted on your current YouTube channel. What video is it? It, it was something with my first minds, it had to be. First video on your current channel is My Phone Cooks Popcorn Vine. Nice, that's super creative title. This iPhone app cooks popcorn. So I don't know why I posted that specific video because that was probably several months into Vine, but Vine came around, I was on YouTube at the time, I think maybe I had 300 or 400,000 followers on my original YouTube channel. And Vine came out, I was living in a house with nine other guys, I was living in the garage, and they were all watching the Vine app and I never got on the app, it took me nine months, I was a little late to the game, but I saw them all looping these, these videos and I was like, what is that? And they're like, oh dude, you should do this because it's got a little special effects category. It was cool because every day I made a different Vine and I challenged myself for 30 days to make just minimum one a day, post it. There's something freeing when you start a platform for the first time, whether it's YouTube, Vine, Snapchat, Instagram, TikTok, like every time your follower count zero, even though it kind of sucks, it's really freeing because you can do creatively anything. There's no one watching, there's no pressure. And that's what I think was the magic for me with Vine was not having that pressure, experimenting with a new style, like the magic style. Vine was a really big surprise. It, kind of took over and to a point where I stopped making YouTube videos full time. All right, please respond to these comments. His outro is longer than the actual content. <laughs> I hadn't figured out how to put like compilations out on YouTube. I remember at the time it was like your video, if it was 45 seconds or more in the algorithm, it did better. I don't know, the algorithm has changed a million times over the years. And so I would add these little outros that would recommend other videos. And um, yeah, those annotations are 
I think also outdated now. So the following comments came from the most viewed video on your current YouTube channel. What video is it? The most viewed video on the YouTube channel now might actually be a video called Furniture Illusions. Is that true? That, that skyrocketed. Furniture Optical Illusions, nice. You might be wondering what kind of furniture it is. You wanna take a guess? This video weirdly took forever to make, but it also didn't take that long compared to a normal YouTube video. The reason it took so long is we created this, this furniture which took months to, to make and actually like craft, and we had our, our carpenter do it, and then um, we actually shot it in just a day. It was a, one of our first steps into making videos where we prep everything beforehand, even if it takes months. The chair is right here. It's actually, it's got a post-it note that's permanently that says no sit <laughs> because uh, people have sit, tried to sit in it and it'll, it just immediately will shatter. Here's some of the most liked comments on that video. Please respond. I bet this guy doesn't even exist and it's just another illusion. Yep, it could be a, could be a deep fake. Imagine visiting his house, you can't get out of there. In my real house, I don't have illusion furniture because I have two kids, they're three and two years old and they break everything. So I don't want anything fragile in my home until they're at least in middle school and probably can like learn to handle it. So all of our like illusion furniture, or illusion objects are at my studio office. Here's one of the first comments on that most viewed video. In the scene with anamorphic illusion at 257, I'm pretty sure that the 3D camera tracking or planar tracking was used here due to the fact that the anamorphic chair seems to shift on the ground slightly. See this video for how it was likely made. So this user maybe made the breakdown of uh, the tutorial of how I did that video. How do you feel about people trying to reveal how you perform your illusions? I, I actually really like it. It's an honor that people go back and frame by frame do it and, and try to figure it out and reverse engineer it. The reason that's fun is it also keeps me on my toes and my team on, on our best performances. We're obviously going frame by frame, making sure everything's really clean. And if people pick up on stuff, that makes us better for the next one. But it's also funny to hear all the theories that are out there. We've, we watch, my team will share some of those videos of breakdowns and we'll hear these, the most wild theories and we're like, yeah, that could be a way. And sometimes we see people actually point out a better way for us to have done it, which is way simpler. We go sometimes so complicated that most people aren't actually guessing them correctly. There's a simpler way, but sometimes it's fun for us to make it more complex for ourselves. <laughs> How have your illusions changed over time? Do you prefer to work with VFX or do you prefer practical illusions or a combo of both? The reason I got into filmmaking was for the practical effects. I love these grand stories that Spielberg was doing, Lucas was doing, and I would watch these behind the scenes and these two hour specials saying like, ILM made these dinosaurs or half of them real to scale or they were really doing these explosions for real. Nowadays, I mean, there's still a lot of movie magic. It looks a little different now. Um, like I love how they were making The Mandalorian with the um, LCD screens, but um, there's something special about having the practical effects on set with the actors to interact with. My illusions have changed over time. They were actually very VFX heavy in the beginning and now they've gone to become very practical. One tip I give people when they're breaking down my videos is if you see it in the frame, it's almost 100% real. There's not much that we're adding in, in post-production. So that is, is special to me that we know we're doing it that practical. We did a recent video where um, I was camping with my kids and it was like how to camp indoor with a blanket fort, but then open up the back and go through and you're out in this beautiful mountain vista and, and a campfire. Let's go. Here, Liam. You wanna roast some horse? Yeah. And the way we did that, like, I guess blew people's mind, but for us it was really simple because we were like, oh, you could do this with no editing. It's just a set that's on a mountaintop and you open it up and yeah, yeah, it's complicated to do all that, but like it's way cooler and it's 100% practical. And those are the, my, my favorite videos to make. A couple years ago, we got really into 3D printing because we realized, you know, we were always customizing these clay props to be at the right scale and it was, it was taking a lot of time. We realized, duh, 3D printing. So we'll do things like this. It'll be at the exact scale that we need and we'll, we'll paint it up or um, make other complimentary props like this little trash bag. We just did a video with a little mailbox, which is pretty cool. No. Oh. Hmm. I had a video where I was tossing myself the football using perspective. So I throw it in the distance, in the foreground, catch a little football. And the way we do this is we'll just take pictures of this, references, do it in 3D, and then print it out. Literally, like two hours later, it'll come out just like this little guy, and we'll paint it up by hand. 
that's how we get our props. I mean, that's the process and we're making these every day. Our printers are going all day because a lot of these don't work. We'll print them out and we'll, we'll frame them and block them and be like, oh, well that concept isn't very good. So we literally have like hundreds of these little miniatures that no one's, we've never used in videos, but we have like a whole collection now library of all these different scales too. While we're talking about the practicality, um, this is a Lego set that one of my team made. Um, Luke made this for me and it, and it spins like this. And this was so we could do a little VFX prep breakdown of the rotating room and how the mechanics of it would work before we built it. In the room, you can see it's just a box, but it's surrounded by these uh, welded metal pieces that are circular, that spin. This is the same stuff they did in Inception. We had, actually had some of the same teamwork on it for us, but this is how we'll do previs, sometimes make it in Legos, so that we can uh, figure out how to pull off the effect. It's cheaper than building the real thing first and getting it wrong. Although, I mean, Legos are still expensive. All right, speed round. Answer the following comments as quickly as possible because otherwise, we'll be here all day. Why do your videos have to be so short? Because they take so long to make. Every second probably takes me about four days to make. So you do the math. What software did you use? Well, back in the day, I used Final Cut Pro. Nowadays, we have some custom stuff that we use for ourselves because we have our own techniques. Adobe Cloud is one of the great places to start. And then from there, you level up. We use like probably two dozen softwares for these videos. Hi Zach, I saw your videos. I got a question. I want to start my career in film too. Can you guide me in any school that I need to go study? I live in New York, we can be friends. Uh, if you come to New York, we can meet and have pizza. I love pizza, I'll take you up on that. I was kind of iffy up until that point. Yes, if you want to start your film career, just start now, you do not need a school for it. In fact, if you have to go into debt for a film school, I'd kind of, i say skip it. Um, you can do this all on your own. And if you look at the cost that you're gonna spend on a film school and what you could buy in gear and go move out to LA for two years or to New York, in New York, one of the other capitals for film, like go meet the film community, buy them pizza, give your crew pizza, and they'll already be wanting to hang out and work with you. The question everyone is asking is, how? Yes, that's the question everyone asks me, how? I used to tell all the kids come up to me in public and they'd be like, how do you do it? I would tell them the truth and they'd walk away really sad. So now we actually, like, like magicians do, kind of guard the secrets a little bit so that we're not blowing it for everyone. I liken it to seeing behind the scenes at Disneyland. You know, if you saw everyone out of costume walking around or with their heads off, it would, you know, you'd freak out. So the magic is, is as a secret, is, is more fun, I think. When will you make the Treasure Island part two? I get that question so much. We were just in pre-production for part two. Quick backstory, I uh, made this crazy short film on a deserted island or like an island out in the middle of Indonesia. Give me that. Hey, look at me, I'm Zach, I'm a cartographer. Hey, I was number one in my class, I'll have you know. It was really fun to make. We posted and we said at the end, if we get over 250,000 likes, we'll make a part two. We started working on part two and then um, the world kind of slowed down. So we're still gonna make it. Just, just when we can get back to another island. It's probably gonna be a while. To conclude, we found these comments on your TEDx talk from six years ago. Wow, yes. I gave a TEDx talk in Portland um, six years ago. I remember literally shaking. It was one of my first times I ever had done public speaking. I think that shows the power that's gonna be in individual creators now that you don't have to be an agency to create. You don't have to have millions of dollars to make your Hollywood movie. You have the power in the tools and the digital technology. So Vine had just come out and um, you know we were getting all these inquiries to do speaking and I went up to Portland, which is my hometown. I, I remember, I, you probably can see me shaking in this video. Zach King inspired me to do magic at my school talent show. That is amazing, I love hearing stuff like that. I wanna do what he does, he's been such an inspiration for me and my brothers that we can all do something amazing with the tube Vine and the whole internet, it's a tool. I hope it can be like him one day. We all love you, Zach King. Keep up the amazing work. Well, thank you, BTS Crackhead. That's their username. No, I, I appreciate it. These comments are amazing because uh, anytime I know my work and my team's work has been seen and get someone to do an action, like create something else, even if it's a copy of my work, I'm like, that's, that's amazing because it's getting you with a camera, you're figuring out the techniques and you're with friends and community doing that. So that, that's the goal of what I do. That's crazy. We just kind of look back at 11 years or like a full decade of being on the internet. One, makes me feel old, but I also feel really young and got a lot of energy to keep going. It's cool to see the journey, how many pivots there actually were. And I think that goes to one of the questions I get asked a lot, which is, how do I get to where you're at? And it's really realizing it's not the last year of being on TikTok that's made me 
uh, famous or the, the first time on Vine. It's all of it in between and it's putting in the work and the hours pretty much every single day. And then you'll get those lucky breaks. You're putting yourself in positions for those lucky breaks. I was always curious and I'd like have this question of like, what would it look like if you had kittens playing with lightsabers? When you ask yourself those questions or those story prompts, what would happen if you followed through on them and posted them out to the world? Look what happened to me, it's kind of a weird journey.